This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa usalli wa usallimu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen. نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أفضل صلاة وأتم التسليم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وقال تعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال تعالى أيضا يوم لا ينفع مال ولا بنون إلا من أتى الله بقلب سليم. All praise and thanks be to Almighty Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, who is our Creator, Sustainer, Nourisher, Protector, and Curer. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal. to shower his choicest of blessings and salutations upon our beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam his family members his companions and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of qiyamah o slaves of allah o children of adam first and foremost i advise myself and then all of you all present here to adopt a life of taqwa and that is to fear allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be conscious of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during every single second of our lives if we wish to attain success in this world as well as the hereafter may allah azza wa jal make us all from the people of taqwa amin before we delve into the subject matter of today's khutbah i would like to begin with an amazing narration an amazing hadith that has been narrated to us by Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu an and the narration goes along the lines of these words Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu goes on to say that once we were with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we were seated with the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam just imagine what a great blessing and what a great opportunity to sit with our beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu states we were seated with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and whilst we were seated with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a gathering suddenly Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the man who is entering now is from the people of Jannah Allahu akbar The man who is entering now is from the people of Jannah. The Sahaba, Ridwan Allah Ta'ala alayhi majma'een, were amazed. They were astounded. They immediately turned to see who this fortunate individual was. They wanted to see who this individual was that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was certifying that he is from the people of Jannah. Allahu Akbar. They were eager. They wanted to know who this individual was. They were looking towards the doorway. and suddenly a man enter, enters the masjid a man emerges a normal looking man but then anas ibn malik radiyallahu anhu goes on to describe he entered and his beard was wet through the water of ablution and there was water dripping there were droplets of water which were dripping from his beard and he had his slippers in his left hand allahu akbar Look at how observant the Sahaba Ridwan Allah Ta'ala alayhi majma'in were. And this shows us the, the, the zeal that they had in their hearts. The eagerness that they wanted to know who this individual was. What is the special deed that he is doing to be certified by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he is from the people of Jannah. Allahu Akbar. They were looking at the man. He entered. 
and he went about in his doing his usual activities in the masjid. The next day, the following day, once again Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the gathering, suddenly he says, "The man who is entering now is from the people of Jannah." Immediately they turn again. They wanted to see who this individual was. It was the same man. And once again his beard was wet after ablution and water droplets were dripping off his beard and he had his slippers in his left hand. The third day, once again they were seated with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. For the third time Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam states, "A man, the man who is entering now, he is from the people of Jannah." Once again they look and they find that it is the same individual. His beard wet after ablution, water dripping, Allahu Akbar, and his slippers in his left hand. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiyallahu anhu could not contain himself. After the gathering of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he rushes to this individual. And he seeks permission from this individual. He does not inform him about what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said in regard to him. But he asked him, can I stay with you? Oh brother, can I stay with you? That man, he permits him. And Abdullah radiallahu anhu stays with that individual for a few nights. His intention was that he wanted to closely monitor this individual. Why? Because he wanted to find out what is the special good deed this individual is doing that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is certifying that he is from the people of Jannah. Allahu Akbar. Look at their zeal. Look at their eagerness. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill our hearts too with such zeal that we look forward to Jannah. Ameen. Now after a few nights passed, Abdullah radiallahu anhu does not notice anything amazing or anything out of the norm that this individual is performing. Rather when night approaches, he sleeps well. The only thing that he notices is that whilst he's sleeping, whenever he turns in his sleep, whenever he shifts positions while sleeping, he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He remembers Allah azza wa jal. He glorifies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is not an individual who fasts during the day. He is not an individual who keeps up the whole night praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nay, he has a good night's sleep and then he wakes up for fajr just like a normal individual. So after a few nights, Abdullah radiallahu anhu now approaches the individual and he says, he informs him about what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said about him. And then he told him, you know, the actual reason why I requested to stay with you is because I wanted to monitor you and I wanted to find out what is the special good deed that you are doing so that I will also be able to bring it in my life, thereby securing Jannah. Allahu Akbar. The man thinks for a while and then he says, because... Abdullah radiallahu anhu asks the individual, can you please tell me, are you performing any secret good deeds? Any good deeds that I cannot see? The man thinks for a while and then he says, no. Ya Abdullah, I am as you see me. This is who I am. I don't perform any secret good deeds. This is who I am. So I don't know what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was indicating. Abdullah radiallahu anhu, was feeling a bit disappointed because he wanted to know so that he could bring it into his own life. He leaves now with a heavy heart because he was disappointed. Now whilst he was leaving, this man calls him out, calls him again, Ya Abdullah, come here. The man comes back. In other words, Abdullah radiallahu anhu comes back and then the man says, well now that you mentioned, I was just thinking about it. There's one thing that I do every night and that is that every night I free my heart from all ill feelings. Allahu Akbar. I free my heart from all ill feelings. I free my heart from hatred. I free my heart from grudges. I free my heart from all types of negative thoughts that my heart may have harbored towards another brother or another sister. Allahu Akbar. And then Abdullah radiallahu anhu states, that is a great deed and that is what we fail to do, Allahu Akbar. Along the lines of these words, that is a great deed that you are doing or that is the great deed that you are performing and we fail to do that great deed. We should try, Allahu Akbar. An amazing narration, my dear, respected elders and brothers in Islam. An amazing narration. And this narration highlights to us the importance of the purity of our hearts.
the purity of our hearts. And that is why the ayah I recited in the beginning, Allah Azza wa Jal, our powerful maker, he states in the noble Quran, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ Your wealth, your net worth will not help you on that day. When is that day? On the day of Qiyamah. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ Your wealth will not avail you. وَلَا بَنُونَ You may have a huge family, you may have many children, they aren't going to help you on that day. What is going to help you on that day? إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Except for the individual who comes with a sound heart, a pure heart, a heart that fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a heart that abides the commandments of Allah azza wa jal, a heart that stays away from all that which Allah azza wa jal has prohibited. In another narration, our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, أَلَا وَإِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ مُضْغَى that in every individual's body, there is a piece of flesh. In every individual's body, there is a piece of flesh. If that piece of flesh is good, if that piece of flesh is sound, if that piece of flesh is upright, then the whole body of that individual will be upright. It will be good. It will be sound. And on the other hand, وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ If that piece of flesh goes bad, if that piece of flesh becomes corrupt, if that piece of flesh is spoiled, it results in the whole body of that individual going bad, going evil, becoming corrupt. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to say, أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ And that piece of flesh is the heart. That piece of flesh is the heart. And when we say heart, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, as I say often, we're not talking about our physical heart. We're not talking about our physical heart. We're talking about our spiritual hearts. And when we say that our hearts are riddled with diseases, we do not mean cardiovascular diseases, nor do we mean our physical hearts. But we mean our spiritual hearts and we're talking about spiritual diseases, spiritual maladies. Maladies that have riddled our hearts and made our hearts sick, made our hearts hard. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. My beloved Shaykh, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, who is rightfully known as the specialist of the hearts because his writings in general revolve around an individual's heart. He talks a lot about the spiritual heart. And he talks a lot about spiritual diseases. There is something that we can derive from his writings, a general conclusion. From his writings, there is something that we derive, and that is that in general, all of the diseases of an individual's heart is linked to one general factor, one general factor, and that is hubbu dunya, and that is the love for this dunya, the love of this world. The more an individual loves dunya, the more an individual loves this worldly life, the harder his heart becomes. The harder his heart becomes. And the more riddled his heart becomes with diseases because of his love that he has for this dunya, for this materialistic worldly life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. And on the other hand, the more he removes the love of this dunya from his heart, his heart becomes pure. His heart becomes soft. His heart becomes supple and tender. His heart becomes more closely attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah azza wa jal make all of our hearts soft and tender. Ameen. The minute our hearts become hard, the minute our hearts become riddled with diseases, that's when we begin our hunt for spirituality. Because my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, you see the creation of man, and these scholars, rahimahumullah, explain. When you look at the creation of man, what are we created of? Allah Azza wa Jal has created our bodies from clay, as we all know. It has been created from clay. Clay is a substance from this dunya. Clay is a substance from this dunya. Now what about our soul? Our soul, our ruh, we don't have much knowledge about it. All we know is that it is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is from the matters of our creator. And our soul is something that is generally or all the time attached to the akhirah. 
Our soul is attached to the Akhirah. And that is why, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, our body, our bodies in general, yearn for this dunya, yearn for this lowly dunya, yearn for the desires of this dunya, the base desires of this dunya, because our bodies have been created from this dunya. On the other hand, our souls desire for the Akhirah. Our souls desire for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our souls desire for Jannah because our souls have been created from the Akhirah. They yearn to go back to the Akhirah. It is from the matters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. As he states in the Noble Quran. Now Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they will come to you asking you about what? Ani ruh, about the ruh. Tell them, Kuli ruhu min amri rabbi. Tell them that the ruh, the soul, is from the matters of my Lord. Allahu Akbar. Wama utitum min al-ilmi illa qalila. And you have not been given knowledge in regard to it except a little knowledge. Only a little knowledge. We live in the era of rockets and modern technology. But what have the scientists, what have the so-called intellectuals of this world found out about the ruh? What have they found out? What have they found out about the soul? They haven't found out anything about the soul. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given us much knowledge in regard to it. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open the doors of goodness for us. And that is why, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, coming back to the creation of man, that is why we yearn for spirituality. Just as how we feed our bodies with food from this dunya, just as how our bodies feel hunger, our bodies feel thirst, and we need to feed our bodies, we need to fuel our bodies, our soul also needs nourishment. Our souls also need food. So what can you feed your soul? Can you feed food? Can you feed water? Can you feed fruits and vegetables? No, you need to nourish your soul with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to nourish your soul by getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to nourish your soul by involving yourself in activities that please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the nourishment for a soul, Allahu Akbar. May Allah Azza wa Jal keep our, all of our souls energized and nourished to please Him. Ameen. Therefore, we begin our hunt towards spirituality the minute our hearts become hard. But then sadly, today we don't know where to go for that spirituality. Some people turn towards yoga. Some people turn towards yoga. Why? Because they are searching for that inner peace. They're looking for spirituality. Some people turn towards locking themselves up in dark rooms and chanting various chants, looking for spirituality. Other people turn towards innovations, looking for spirituality to make their hearts soft. They involve themselves in all kinds of dances, all kinds of whirling dances to try and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, none of which is in accordance with the sunnah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Have you ever heard of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dancing while remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Does that even make sense? No. We are going away. We are actually looking for spirituality and drifting away from the pure sunnah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah in his book, Imam Bukhari rahimahullah has devoted a complete chapter known as Kitab al-Riqaq. In other words, the chapter of heart softness. The chapter of heart softness. Where in that chapter, he focuses. And the crux of the matter that can be derived from that chapter is that the main disease for an individual, for an individual's heart to become riddled with diseases is the love for this dunya. Is the love for this dunya and drifting away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So primarily we need to uproot that love that we have firmly embedded in our hearts in regard to this dunya. We need to uproot that love by bringing in our hearts that this life, this materialistic life is a temporary life, is a temporary life. 
The mere fact that we are going to leave this dunya should make us think that there is no point in amassing millions and building mansions to live permanently in this life because we are not going to live permanently. We are going to live for a very short span of time in this dunya. Our permanent life is the akhirah and that is where our focus needs to be. And that is what we need to be preparing for. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to do so. Moving on to the diseases of an individual's heart. Now I just gave you all an introduction into the importance of softening your hearts. Now we move on to the diseases that riddle an individual's heart. Time does not permit for me to list the diseases and to touch on every single disease. Therefore, I wish to fo focus on one particular disease, a very destructive disease known as Hasad. This disease sadly has become widespread and many of us, myself included, our hearts are riddled with some form of hasad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify our hearts. Ameen. So what is hasad? Hasad is an Arabic term. And before I define hasad, I would like to highlight something. That Arabic is such a beautiful language, such an, such an eloquent language, that English or any other language for that matter, fails to encompass the beauty of Arabic. Therefore, even if you were to try and translate an Arabic word into English, English fails to do justice to that Arabic term. Say for example, if you talk about the term Rabb, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our Rabb. Allah azza wa jal is our Rabb. Now if I were to try and translate that into English, Rabb is translated in English as Lord. Lord. But now when I say Lord, you don't really fathom the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the term Lord. But on the other hand, when we look at the term Rabb, there is a list of translations given for the word Rabb. Nourisher, protector, curer, provider. He is the one who sustains us. He is the one who provides for us. All of this comes in the term Rabb. Arabic is such a deep and eloquent language. So now coming back to the term that I wish to translate, Hasad. Hasad is an Arabic term that can be translated as jealousy, or envy. And in general, when you look at the English language, in other words, into these two terms, jealousy and, in, and, and envy, more or less they are synonyms. They stand for the same meaning. But after a deeper analysis, we come to a conclusion that there is a slight difference between the two, between jealousy and envy. Jealousy is when you have something, when you own something, you have something and you fear losing it to someone else. That is the correct definition for jealousy. Jealousy is when you have something and you fear losing it to someone else. You fear losing it to someone else. That's when you feel jealous. And on the other hand, envy is when you see something that someone else has. When you see something that someone else has and you desire it because you do not have it. When you see something that someone else has and you desire it because you don't have that particular object. That is the definition of envy. Now both of this, jealousy and envy is incorporated in the term hasad. Now coming back to hasad in its Arabic sense, hasad is of two types. So now that I've given you the definition of hasad, I won't translate it henceforth as you all most probably now understand what hasad is. Hasad is of two types. Hasad is of two types. A positive type and a negative type. Let's deal with the negative, negative type first. Now the negative type is a type which is full of hatred, envy, and also pure negativity, this negative type. This is when you see someone being blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by a particular blessing, and when you see that person enjoying that particular blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you just want that blessing to be removed from that individual. This is the negative type of hasan. Say for example, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed an individual with a beautiful house. With a beautiful house. Now you look at that individual and deep down all of these ill feelings start dominating your heart where you wish destruction for that house. You wish that that house be destroyed and removed away from that individual. This is the negative type of hasad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. And it is not only applicable to objects. It is also applicable to talents. Maybe you see an individual who is extremely intelligent. An individual 
who is perhaps a good speaker, an individual who is doing well in business, an individual who is enjoying a high position of power and authority. Now you look at that individual and you envy that individual. You wish that that talent be stripped away from him. Allahu Akbar. This is a very evil type of jealousy, an evil type of hasad. It is a very self-destructive emotion because it destroys the individual who harbors that emotion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. Look at the story of the children of Adam alayhi salatu was salam. The two sons of Adam alayhi salatu was salam. Allah azza wa jal accepted the sacrifice of one of, the, one of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the sacrifice of one of the sons of Adam alayhi salatu was salam resulting in the other son becoming jealous of his brother and that led him to killing, murdering his own brother. Now you see how destructive this emotion is. It makes a brother kill another brother. Allahu Akbar. His own brother, his own blood brother. This quality is from the devil. It resulted in him murdering his own brother. But then on the other hand, the brother who was murdered, he had a pure heart. He had a clean heart. He had a sound heart. And what did he say when this brother came to kill him, when his own brother came to kill him? What did the brother who had a pure heart say? Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the beautiful statement in the Noble Quran, the statement of this brother. If you, my brother, outstretch your hand to kill me, even if you outstretch your hand to kill me for this petty issue, ma ana the translation goes along the lines of these words. I will not outstretch my hand to kill you. Why? I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the worlds, the creator of the worlds. Allahu Akbar. That was because of his pure heart. Even when his brother approached to kill him, he said that I will not kill you. It is because of a pure and sound heart. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with pure hearts. Moving on to the second type, which is an interesting type because it is a positive type of hasad. It is a positive type of hasad. And it is known as ghibta. It is known as ghibta. And this is when you see a blessing. When you see a blessing in another individual and you want that very same blessing, but you don't want it removed from that individual. When you see a blessing in another individual, and you want that very same blessing just as they have it without them losing it. This is the positive type of hasad. There is one particular narration where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, La hasad illa fitnain. There is no hasad. You cannot harbor hasad except in two cases. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to clarify. Number one is in regard to an individual whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him with knowledge and he is imparting that knowledge. The narration goes along the lines of these words. An individual whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him with knowledge, with wisdom, and he is imparting that knowledge. He is disseminating that wisdom. He is teaching others. You can envy that individual. You can have hasad in regard to that individual. How I wish that I had such knowledge too, so that I also could impart knowledge. Now you're not wishing that the knowledge be taken away from that individual. All you're wishing is that I also wish that I had knowledge to impart like how that individual is doing. It's permissible to do so. It's a praiseworthy type of hasad. And the second type is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses an individual with wealth, with money, with wealth. And that individual is spending that wealth in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now if you do not have such wealth, you can have hasad in regard to that individual. Oh, how I also wish that I had such wealth so I could spend in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
like how that blessed and fortunate individual is doing so. How I wish I had wealth so that I could spend for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that I could spend for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just as how that individual is spending. So my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, scholars rahimahumullah explain that in regard to this particular type of hasad, this positive type of hasad, they explain that you can harbor this type of hasad as long as it's in regard to good matters. As long as it is in regard to good matters. If it is in regard to deeny matters and nothing in regard to this dunya. Now you cannot harbor hasad in a way that, oh, this individual has, has a nice car, has an expensive motor vehicle. How I wish I also had such a motor vehicle, but let him also have his motor vehicle. No, this is not known as ghibta. It is only applicable to matters of goodness. It is only applicable to matters that are related to deen, that are related to pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for the matters that are related to this dunya, to this materialistic worldly life, you cannot have hasad in regard to it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. Now that I have given you all the two types, the positive and the negative type of hasad, there's one more thing that I wish to clarify. Look at the narration. Even though it is a positive type, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam starts the narration off by saying, لا حسد إلا في اثنين. So uh, Alama, uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani rahimahullah, he mentions in his famous book, Fathul Bari, in regard to this, as to why did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even though it is a positive type, it is a positive and a praiseworthy type, why did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam state hasad. Why did Rasulullah use the word hasad? Because hasad is a negative type. Ghibta is the positive type. Why did Rasulullah mention the negative type even for the positive type? And he explains the reason being is because even in the positive type, it begins in a negative sense because you are noticing a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has been conferred upon another individual, ignoring the blessings that have been conferred upon you. You are ignoring the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with. If you look at your own life, you have been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by numerous blessings. But instead of looking at your own life and showing gratitude unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are looking at another individual who has been blessed with certain blessings and then you are having hasad. Even though it's positive, it begins with negative and then becomes positive as long as it's in regard to matters of goodness. But if it is in regard to matters of this dunya, and also if you wish that that blessing be stripped away from that individual, then it is a blameworthy type of hasad. It is a blameworthy type. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. And Imam ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah goes on to mention almost around 15 to 20 evil consequences that an individual who harbors the evil type of hasad will have to face. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. Due to the lack of time, I'll just touch on three very swiftly. Three evil consequences. Number one, hasad fills an individual. The evil type of hasad fills an individual's life with negativity. He becomes a dull, dark, gloomy and negative individual. Why? Because he's ignoring all of the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him with. And he's looking at other individuals. Oh, how I wish my life was like this individual. How I wish I had a house like this individual. How I wish I had a, a car like this individual. How I wish I had this. How I wish I had that. He is never grateful to Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is never positive. He is always negative. He becomes a very negative dark and gloomy individual. He never has a positive outlook in regard to his life. His life is never bright. Each and every morning when he gets up, he gets up with negativity. He has an aura of negativity around him. He starts to affect the individuals who are around him also because of his negative attitude. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all and may Allah azza wa jal bless us all with positive attitudes to become like our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was the biggest optimist ever to walk on the face of this planet. The next evil consequence that an individual has to face is that he will be filled with false senses of reality. False senses of reality. And I'll explain. Look at the story 
of the creation of our father, Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. What happened? Allah azza wa jal created Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and commanded Iblis and the angels to prostrate unto Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. The angels, لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون. The angels, they are blessed creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They immediately complied and they fell down in sajda. They did not question the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah azza wa jal is the maker and he does what he wills and what he wishes. But on the other hand, what happened to Iblis? Iblis' heart was riddled with hasad now. Why? Because he felt, what did he say? خَلَقْتَنِي خَلَقْتَنِي مِن نَارٍ وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِن طِينٍ Now he started to suffer a inferiority or a superiority complex where he started to say, I have been created of fire. I have been created of fire. And he, Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, has been created of clay. Now why should I make sajita to him? Now look at the false sense of reality that filled his heart. You know, what was it? He thought that now he is going to lose the high position that he is enjoying. He was enjoying a high position at that time. He thought now that Adam alayhi salatu wasalam has come into the scene. Now that Adam alayhi salatu wasalam has come into the equation. Now Adam alayhi salatu wasalam is going to strip him of his high position. You see, a false sense of reality. Whilst in reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was just a mere command. Allah azza wa jal was not going to strip Iblis of anything. It was a command to check who was obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, Iblis, failed that test, resulting in him becoming a curse and thrown out. Allahu Akbar. False sense of reality. Look at the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. The brothers of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. Why do you think they went and dumped their own brother Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam in a dark well? Why? Jealousy, hasad, a false sense of reality. They thought, they were under the impression that their father had a soft spot for Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam and that soft spot would result in the father hating them. Whilst that never was the case. That never was the case. It was a false sense of reality. This hasad, this evil type of hasad fills your heart with false senses of reality. Where you start thinking, oh, that individual prefers that individual better. Or maybe my boss likes or is closer to that employee over me. All kinds of false senses of reality. Maybe my mother hates me and loves my brother or my sister. It is from the devil. It is from shaitan. It is one of the traps of shaitan where shaitan whispers all kinds of false senses of reality in your heart. And the final evil consequence, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, is that this self-destructive emotion, this self-destructive quality of hasad, eats away and destroys all of your hard-earned good deeds. Allahu Akbar. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, إِنَّ الْحَسَدَ يَأْكُلُ الْحَسَنَاتِ كَمَا تَأْكُلُ النَّارُ الْحَطَمُ Indeed, jealousy destroys your good deeds. And now look at the example Rasulullah s.a.w. gives. Indeed, jealousy destroys your good deeds just as how a fire gobbles up firewood. Firewood. You know when you have firewood, dry firewood, the minute you light firewood, it crackles and it goes up in flames. And all that remains are the ashes of that firewood. The fire just gobbles up firewood. Just like fire gobbles up firewood, even without you knowing, by you harboring this self-destructive emotion, this self-destructive quality, that quality will destroy all of your good deeds. Why do you come to the masjid early? Why do you come for Jumu'ah? Why do you come for the five salawat to the masjid? Why do you read the Quran? Why do you fast in the month of Ramadan? Why do you spend and go through all the sacrifice to go for Hajj? Why do you go on Umrah? Why do you give out Sadaqah? Why do you give out Zakah from your money? Why do you involve yourselves in so much of good deeds only to have all of those good deeds gobbled up by jealousy? By a tiny thought of jealousy where you think evil of someone, where you harbor jealousy in regard to someone, when your heart becomes hard, you lose all of those good deeds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. 
Look at the hadith that I started off with, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. If you maintain a pure heart, you are guaranteed Jannah. What did that man do? No special deeds, no great mountains of good deeds. He was not an individual who was fasting every single day. He was not an individual who was up the whole night praying thousands and thousands of raka'at. No. He was an individual who had a pure heart, a good heart, a clean heart. And that is what you and I, we lack today. All of us, we have hearts, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, but we look down upon people. We think bad about people. We have grudges about people. We hate people. We are selfish. We only think about ourselves. We don't have pure hearts. Let us work on our hearts. Let us work on purifying our hearts, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. The minute we purify our hearts, we will be able to sleep well. Why? Because we do not harbor any kind of a grudge towards anybody. We do not hate anyone. Let anyone enjoy anything. After all, this is a temporary dunya. A dunya where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not even have the value of a goat with its ears cut, a dead goat. Even that, Rasulullah gave a comparison in regard to this dunya. It is like a dead goat with its ears cut. No value at all. Allahu Akbar. But we hanker behind dunya. We run behind dunya. We have made dunya our focus. We have made dunya our aim. We have made dunya our end goal. Whilst on the other hand, the akhirah, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be our end goal. Therefore, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, let us work on purifying our hearts. Let us work on maintaining the beautiful relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us work on getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let us work on following the authentic sunnah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let us stay away from all kinds of innovations. For every innovation is a misguidance. And every misguidance is in the blazing fire of Jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. May He the Almighty forgive all of our sins. And just as how He united us here this beautiful afternoon, may He unite us in the gardens of Jannah.